Welcome everybody to the latest uh, 6x6 virtual social. Um, got a cloudy day here on Merseyside. We had a beautiful day earlier, but it's just, uh, it's just gone a bit grey. But we're going to brighten the evening up with uh, two of the founder members of 6x6, Stephen McCoy and Stephanie Wynn, who of course are better known to the outside world as McCoy Wynn. And they're going to be talking about their fantastic uh, project called Triangulation. Um, Steph and Stephen have been working together since 1997 and this, uh, this particular project they actually started it around 10 years ago um, and they kept it as a bit of a secret because I certainly didn't know about it for years and years and years um, and then slowly they started uh, showing little bits of it and over the, the last three four years it's had outings at uh, two editions of the Luke Photography Festival here in Liverpool uh, as well as in Blackpool as well. Um, so the, um, the project itself, itself is still ongoing and we're very, very excited to hear about what might be the next stage of it. So I'm just going to hand over to Steve and Steph. It's going to be the usual thing. They're going to talk, illustrate their uh, work, and then we'll be taking questions. So if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat function and um, Craig will have a wee look at them. And then after Steph and Stephen have finished, we'll get around to some questions. So I'll hand over to you and hope you enjoy this evening's event. Hi, everybody. Okay, then. so six by six social, and this is our triangulation. To give you a framework, um, we're using the short essay by uh, Dr. Les Roberts that he produced last year um, in response to triangulation. Uh, the full piece can be read on our website. Um, it's about three spatial stories, and they encompass firstly, the history of triangulation, ordnance survey, cartography, the peculiarities of the British landscape. Secondly, looking at cultural history of the landscape, putting a frame around a chaotic world. And finally, our odyssey or our quest uh, to find the physical reality from points on a map. Um, and I guess um, I think it's probably worthwhile just spending five minutes talking about um, what triangulation is really. And you'll have to forgive me if uh, there's any mathematicians watching, you know, because uh, I did actually get grade five maths at O level. So I'm an expert on triangulation, but it's a mathematical system using trigonometry to measure angles and distances between two or three points. And it was used by the Ordnance Survey um, for accurate map making. Um, they used the principles of trigonometry to make maps uh, from about 1791 in, in a systematic way. And prior to this, the, the whole process was very piecemeal. The principles of trigonometry were known for a long time, I but to actually... I think, I think a, a point is it was very piecemeal, um, but it had been known as a, as a form of survey for a long time, since the yeah. medieval times. Henry VIII put an awful lot of money <laughs> into surveying the landscape. Um, he sent Thomas Cromwell out to survey the British coast so um, they could see how much ordnance, uh, how, what the fortifications were along the British coast. I think what, what concerns us in this project really is what is known as the re-triangulation of Great Britain, which began in about 1936. And from that date, the, the sort of well-known concrete pillars um, were built. And this is the very first one on the screen at the moment in um, Cold Ashby, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we're basically using the 310 primary pillars in our project. Um, there's over 6,000 that were eventually built as more accurate and larger scale maps were required, more measurements were needed. But there's about 310 primary trigs all over the country. And obviously to keep the, the project reasonably manageable, we've decided just to use those 310 for this particular project. And here you can see on the right hand side, there's actually a couple of guys building the very first trig points that we showed you previously using a, a concrete former. Uh, they, they mixed the concrete on site. Um, and obviously, you know, some of them were, were built on, you know, quite high hills. So it involved an awful lot of um, logistics in, in trying to get materials up to these high places. Teams of people were, were used and, um, you know, they used, they used ponies and, you know, this, that and the other to try and get the materials up. And on the left hand side, it's just a, an overview really of the, the whole of the British Isles with all the, the trig points 
marked on it and showing how they kind of interlink. Because obviously the main point of triangulation, if you like, is the fact that once these concrete pillars were built, measurements were taken from the top of one with a theodolite, and you can see this on the left-hand side, to two other pillars. And on these sort of two other pillars that could be seen from this particular primary trig pillar, lights were set up and a lot of the readings were actually taken at night so that the lights could be seen. So the angles were measured very precisely and again principles of trigonometry, once the angles were known between two or three points, distances between those points could be measured. And we've taken that and on the right hand side is a photograph of the camera that we, we use set up on top of the trig point because the whole point of this project really is the fact that we are using the trig pillar as the, the basis of the photograph. So every photograph we make, the camera is, is on the trig pillar. It's a fixed viewpoint with no variation. I mean, we felt that the 360 degree view was the most valid viewpoint. It's, it's democratic viewpoint and it's a, devoid of any aesthetic decision making. By placing the camera on top of the pillar, um, our point is fixed, very much like the surveyor's point was fixed. And we show the whole view. So it's a full 360, it's a full 360. Full 360 panorama. So when that is partnered with the photograph of the pillar, you see a complete view of the scene. Now, the panorama um, is very much um, an abstract view. Um, and it's like abstract map projections of the landscape. All maps are a distortion of, of, of reality. Um, this is a picture of um, a tabula, uh, which is, which this is actually a medieval copy of a Roman map. This is a 13th century copy of a Roman map. And the Romans drew their maps um, in linear form um, along their roadways. Um, if you can sort of see um, on here that we have um, here, this is this is Great Britain, and I, I've just blown that up there. Um, you can see Hadrian's Wall there. Um, Scotland is a, a bit limited in detail, and this no, no change there than Colin, <laughs> really, you know. Um... And then these, the map stretches and spreads right the way in a single line all the way to the Ganges to the Near East. So by using the long ribbon-like prospect of the panoramic image, we wanted to sort of chime with this different aspect of, of map making. And I think, um, you know, many people think that the, the triangulation pillar is, just marks the highest point of, of a hill, for instance, um, such as this example here of a rifle. Um, but even though this, the, the project itself has very strict guidelines, you might say, in that we're, we're setting ourselves very kind of, uh, you know, um, strict parameters, I guess. Um, although these are obviously influence the whole project, the idea of, of beauty and the sublime and pictorialism affect the, the final picture. Um, the framing of the view is obviously predetermined, but the kind of the weather and the light conditions play a, a really crucial role one definition of the sublime in, in the arts, you know, includes awe and fear in the face of a landscape. And this one of a rifle probably demonstrates that quite nicely because when we were walking up there, the weather conditions were quite poor. Fortunately, when we got to the top, the cloud lifted sufficiently for us to see the landscape below. And so we were almost on the, on the same level, weren't we, as, yeah. as the actual cloud layer, although we could see below it. Um, so the kind of way that we actually also show the pictures, um, certainly on the website, is, is very much like this. It's not how we would choose to maybe exhibit them, but on a website, it's one way to view them. So for instance, the panorama is along the top. The trig picture of the trig pillar is below. The legend, in this case, it's Black Coombe, Cumbria. We also show the elevation, 600 meters, and the map reference, so that if anybody did want to kind of following our footsteps as it were, they could find it quite easily. And the small kind of detail map shows how it links through to all of the trig points close by. 
I think all this with all the information as well is about how we're trying to create a new form of Atlas. Um, and I think that's also what it's about. It's about having this, this new form of Atlas with all these images and um, viewpoints and uh, projections of the British landscape. Um, the awe of the landscape is really quite important. Um, and some, an image like this that, that is, is seen as probably very romanticised or pictorial. Um, when we went to take uh, this particular photograph, um, it was actually at the bottom, it was very dry and sunny with absolutely no snow whatsoever. And it wasn't until we got to the, the top of Black Coombe that we had this incredible white landscape at the mm. top. Yeah. And you can see on, on when it is printed as a, as a large print, you can actually see in the distance, you can see um, uh, the Isle of Man here in the distance, and you can see um, uh, cellar fields, the nuclear power plant. So there's all sorts of indicators about, about where it is on the landscape. And uh, obviously with this one in particular, because the sun was quite low, you can also see the, just there, the shadow of the, the camera actually on top of the triangulation pillar. I mean, we were just reading recently actually about when this was originally surveyed, this particular one, the survey teams had to wait for about a week and a half before the cloud lifted sufficiently for them to take readings. So we were quite fortunate on this day that we got there when there was no cloud, God, I guess. No cloud at all. So some of them take a track to find and, and some of them are somewhat easier to find um, and are more prosaic. Um, this one was, wasn't actually that easy to find in some respects because it's hidden in plain sight by the street furniture. Um, we sort of were looking around for it and then said, oh God, yeah, it's behind the National Trust sign. Um, so some, some don't take as, as much of a journey to, to get to, but they still are a quest to find. Um, equally so, this one, uh, which was actually quite close to a road, um, but it was obscured from the road by the trees that had grown up um, around it uh, since it was placed there. Um, many of the pillars are obsolete, um, so vegetation has grown up around them and the evidence of a, of a changed landscape over the last 90 years. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of variety as well, isn't it? It's a yeah. variety of of placements that we've found, even in a very quite small country, the, the UK really, relatively small, but the variety of landscape and where they're placed is, is really quite incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for these two, as a variety of landscape, uh, these are both in Suffolk, um, and not that far from each other, but a very different landscape. You've got here on the left is, um, you know, the, the woodland area that obviously, when the time when, when the pillar was put in, must have been clear open space. Um, and it, this is a place called Woolpit and on the right, um, I don't know if you can quite see that, but there's the, the trig pillar there just at the side of the field um, and this is a place called Helian's Bumstead, which I just think when we're finding, going on these um, odyssey, being able to see, find all these fantastic named places as well is quite fascinating. Um, the next one, um, this is a, also Suffolk, and this is called Puttocks Hill. Um, now, I don't know if anybody can see the, the column, but it's actually here, behind the tree. It's actually Leylandi hedging, it's behind. Um, now, this was actually on um, private land um, at the side of, of two houses in quite a remote area, uh, and we attempted to ask uh, the landowners if we could get access. Um, but when I was ringing at their gate, um, it was only their dogs in the yard that responded. I don't uh, like dogs. Don't like dogs. <laughs> and they, they were dogs. not small dogs. Um, so we actually had to climb over a gate and had to, on this occasion, quite swiftly um, take this photograph uh, because the dogs were getting closer and closer to the fence. Um, I'll just show the next shot. Now this is the view from the top uh, of that trig pillar. Um, and I think you can see as well, 
it was actually pouring with rain. There's little sort of raindrops on the lens. This was was quite a, a difficult one to achieve, it wasn't was, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it was difficult to, to find as well, even because the problem is sometimes that even you look at the map. You know, you got the map there, you got the map reference, whatever. You can be within a you know a hundred yards, two hundred yards of some of these trig pillars, and you know them in the vicinity, but some of them you just you just can't find. You can't can see you? them. No. Whereas, yeah, I mean, some are in plain view. Uh, this one on Great Wernside in North Yorkshire, um, it was there next to a, a car that somebody had erected, um, but it was quite difficult to see. And if I just flick to the next one, it is there, but because it's grey like the rocks, trying to find it as you're walking up the hill is quite difficult. And the other point to, to kind of like make with, with this photograph as well is I think the difference in you know the time really between you know perhaps doing the panorama and you can see the two figures seated there and in the next photograph they've obviously moved by the time that we've taken the photograph of the trig pillar and these these, these photographs of the actual trig pillar is probably the only time that we would make an aesthetic decision about the composition we do a variety of shots obviously but where the pillar is in relation to the landscape um, is, is obviously an aesthetic decision that we would make. Um, I think so a point is as well is that we both also do photograph the trig yeah, pillar. Yeah. This, this is what we do. We do also both photograph and it then becomes um, an argument about which one of us can justify which is the best <laughs> image to go with the 360 degree. It's a good artistic debate. It is. It's it's a good artistic nothing debate. wrong with that. No. Um, I mean, I think the, these, these single trig pillar photographs as well. We, we, we've kind of exhibited them in a different variety of ways. We've, we've exhibited them so they're alongside the large trig. We've exhibited them so they may be a distance away from it. But we really think that these are absolutely essential to an understanding of the project because they show the point from which the panorama was taken from. So there's the, the trig pillar. And obviously the one above is the camera on the trig pillar with the 360 yeah, panorama. Um, similarly for this one, you know, um, the trig pillars, because they're kind of becoming obsolete and they're, they're being used for a variety of purposes uh, and people take ownership of the pillars sometimes. And this one is difficult to see on the screen, but there's actually a memorial to a local regiment actually on the face of the trig pillar. And although we, you know, we, we don't avoid photographing people um, when we're doing the panoramas, if there's people there, We'll photograph them, but in in this case, it was um, it seemed to be mainly the sheep that were interested in in what we were doing and watching us very carefully, in, in, a, in a quite a critical fashion. <laughs> we thought, you know, but um, um, just talking about the kind of strategy and method, I guess now is is you know how we go about the project itself, because I think photography is very well suited to big projects, you know, taking your time over things, spending. A lot of energy over you know photographing it, you know it can repay that that sense of time i think is important in a big project isn't and, it? and, and this has taken so far well, 10 has, years yeah yeah so and i guess the one of the reasons i mean 10 years ago we had a five-year plan didn't we to, to yeah. photograph them all but um, yeah. here we are still kind of like working through them and one of the reasons obviously is the huge constraints of, of time and money really uh, and, and in many although we've, we've we have photographed virtually all the ones close to our local kind of or, you know home base in Crosby well, yeah. um, there's still quite a lot that you know we need to travel to and the, the, obviously the ones now are further and further away so we need to you know spend a couple of days longer probably working in an area but one of the things that we that we do do is whenever we've got a commission for instance this one we had a commission in, in Brighton and Ditchling Beacon is just outside Brighton so we travel down we photograph this one in the evening mm -hmm. again low sun so you can see that the shadow of the the trig pillar with the camera on top and then we spent a couple of days then working on mm -hmm. the commission so at least at least the commission covered our our travel costs but the problem is of course it you know it makes it very piecemeal but you know the advantages are that we're, we are covering some of our costs at least i guess and also it means we have the constraint that we can't choose the day and we can't choose the weather and we can't choose the time of day because we're, we're having to work on that basis of just what is what is there at the time which in fact 
it is valid and, and it gives such a varied view really of of the weather and of the times of day and the seasons in Britain. Similarly, this one, um, Rockhole Hill, 230 meters, 230 meters above sea level near Redcar. We were again commissioned to go and, and do some shots of a, of a scaffold firm who was erecting in the local power station in Middlesbrough. in Middlesbrough. So again, the evening before, we traveled down and managed to, to photograph this, this um, trig pillar very close to the what are these the cliffs that is that is there some of the highest i'm not sure if they're the highest but they're nearly the highest sea cliffs right by Britain. right by the coast i mean you can see probably there that's the the red dot marks the trig pillar right next to the coast and obviously you can see the the sort of horizon line of the sea in the in the distance now this is one of my favorites um i think one of the reasons it's a favourite is that going back to that idea of having these linear ribbons and uh, the, the Roman maps that are, are just a longer road, uh, this is on Ilkley Moor or by Ilkley, it's Rumbles Moor by Ilkley. And as you can see, there's a pathway that runs sort of along the image. So you've got like a pathway that runs horizontally along the image, very much like that, that Rome, those Roman road images. Um, but one of the other things that always interests me about this is that the Ordnance Survey was set up, obviously, on a military basis initially. Uh, I think in 1791 it was, it was for military bases, and I think it was actually um, used as part of the control of Scotland because they wanted to see what was, was there. 1740, wasn't it? That was 1740. Yeah. So, so, but it, so that was the original reasoning behind it. And, and this one again, if I, if I go a close up, you can see here, this is actually um, men with RAF radomes. And uh, these are a listening and early warning device um, just above Harrogate. Um, what's interesting is that we can see them in the photograph, um, but they're not actually labeled on the OS, OS, OS map. Um, it's like, a, another play on what you can see in a map and what a map records and what is the importance of maps and um, accuracy in maps has always been about power and control and um because you know if you know what's there you can tax it <laughs> right so and in this case we can see that the the military are there but they're not actually quite visible on the map why um, this next photograph I kind of relates again to the uh, the idea of the, the quest I suppose and, um, and and sort of weather conditions as well because um, even this might look like you know a, a beautiful vista from the top of the Stiper Stones in, in Shropshire again 536 meters above sea level uh, what you don't get from the photographs really is a, is a sense of, of the strength of the wind and it was extremely windy when we took this really photograph bad. Um, it was really bad. Um, it, it was so bad that basically um, that we had to climb to the top. I mean, you can see where the where the, the trig column is. It's you know relatively small kind of outcrop of rock, okay. but still difficult to climb up to. And in fact, we had to hold the. the I was holding the tripod with the camera on, on top of the the trig pillar. And, and Stephanie was and actually, I had to, and we both had to climb up, but there wasn't enough space on the top for both of us to stand. So Steve climbed up, put the uh, camera on top of the pillar, and had to hold it down um, to stop it getting blown off by the wind. And then I had to was about sort of three feet below him with my arms round his legs to stop him being blown actually off the the, the top of the, of the peak. Where, but when you see the the image, it uh, it, it belies it's um, it, the the violence of the wind really. Yeah. Another thing that kind of uh, kind of interested as well at one point, apart from the map projections, was Chinese scroll painting as well, which were you know painted, but th as the name suggests, they were rolled up in a scroll, and a lot of them uh, feature sort of mountainous landscapes and pine forests. But there's always little figures in, and you can just see a couple of small figures. In this image here obviously we realize the limitations of showing them on the web and this is one reason why you know um th they really work best as, as as big prints 
Um, the other problem, that, well, is it a problem? I don't know it's whether it's a problem, a problem or not. Though. You know, in terms of the weather conditions, um, it's all too obvious in, in this photograph of, of Winter Hill in Rivington. Um, it's still a valid view, even though it, is, it becomes a non-view because you can't see anything because of the kind of the low cloud and fog that was, um, you know, during that particular day or that, that, that. It was actually August Bank Holiday it, Monday. That's right, it was August Bank Holiday, <laughs> yeah. So there you go. And you can just about see, I think, through the, the mist and fog, the um, TV masts that are, that are actually on Winter Hill. So that, that I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is as an indicator, really, yeah. of the variety of landscape as well. Obviously, in the previous photograph, we had this sort of the, the grey with, with the, the fog, but quite, quite actually a similar landscape to this in that it, it's sort of peat bog area. Um, and that sort of, you know, it, it's quite a, a British landscape in, in those high, air, high sort of regions. Um, we did actually have to visit this particular uh, trig pillar twice. Um, the first time we went out, um, we actually were joined by um, Ken Taylor, who was writing an article about um, triangulation. And it was... We failed, didn't we? We failed. We failed. We, we failed. failed. Yeah. So we, we, went, we went and um, it started to snow really quite badly while we were out there. There had, was some snow on the ground, but it started to get really quite heavy. And we were advised by the Derbyshire Peak Park rescue team or whatever they were <laughs> to, to get ourselves down to a lower level. Um, so it's one of those things that on this occasion, we tried to kill a writer, but we didn't. Um, <laughs> Damn. Um, if only been a solicitor, we might have succeeded. <laughs> so we, the following week, we went back, uh, Ken unfortunately couldn't join us on that occasion, but the following week we went back and we did, we were able to find it. But as you can see that the, the snow is still lying in the hollows. And I think that was probably, was what was the danger that the, the rangers were scared of is that because these hollows are quite deep and if you'd have fallen in those, we, they, they wouldn't well, have found that, us. This is another, another case in point really about how difficult sometimes they are to find because we knew we were in about 200 yards we knew of this there. particular pillar. But you can imagine a sort of whiteout, and it was snowing quite heavily, a lot of snow on the ground, and trying to find a white painted triangulation pillar mm. in the snow, you know, is, is quite difficult. Yeah. Now, this one again is an unusual. Um, people have always been quite helpful when we've been out. We do ask people, you know, have you seen this? And explain to them what we're, we're doing and what we're looking for, because they're not always obvious. Um, obviously we, we had the map reference for this one, but when we arrived, it was on a small housing estate and we couldn't see where it was. Um, so it was a case of knocking on doors and saying, have you got a trig pillar in your garden or have you seen one of them? Unfortunately, um, this particular household were happy to let us in. The only thing was they were apologetic because uh, I think they thought that they hadn't looked after it properly. Well, we, we actually said that we were we were carrying out a survey for the ordnance survey. No, I, no, I didn't. Oh, I didn't, didn't tell Sorry. lies. Oh, didn't you? I didn't tell lies. I said they were carrying out for a survey and it was all about ordnance ah, survey. Yeah, but right. they may have thought that yeah. we were working for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but anyway, they were quite happy to let us in and we took these photographs. And as you can see here, there is the pillar and it's embedded in their garden wall. But it's just one of the tri uh, triangulation photographs that I really like because it, it, it's got that story about that garden with all those their pairs of things and they, they were so happily let us in. This one again, this is difficult to see again. We, we tried to find this and this is in uh, Wiltshire. Um, a lot of trees, again, vegetation had grown up in the area since this um, triangulation pillar had been put there. So it was a real quest to try and find this. It was this. quite dense woodland. It was it? dense There's woodland. No, no paths to it. It was just completely dense woodland trying to find, you know, again, that the trig pillar had been covered, in, covered over in moss. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to see in the, in the green vegetation. And I think it's probably our map reading skills, um, sort of, you know, 
<laughs> they may be getting better. They are getting better, yeah. Yeah. So, and this is actually the pillar here in yeah. in the middle of the woodland. I mean, there you know there is a sense of kind of exploration and quest involved in this project. We think you know it's been made to us. The point's been made to us a couple of times, hasn't it? The kind of Odyssey or the quest, the story behind maybe some of the the kind of the trig pillars and our attempt to photograph them. Um, you know, it is also well. People say it's quite interesting, um, and this almost it, it, it sort of reminds me of coming across some kind of ruined ziggurat in the Amazonian forest. You know, and this is Wiltshire, isn't it? You know, and it's yeah. it's trying to find these things that that, that we say are, are now obsolete. Really, becoming more, more and more, more obsolete. obsolete. And the other the other point about access as well. You know, trying to find. Um, the trig point in many cases is, is, is great. You know, you look at the map, you think there it is, it still exists. There's the blue triangle. You get there and you find it's surrounded by a barbed wire fence. You can see it through the fence, but you can't gain access to it. Unfortunately, with this particular one, Oldport Heights in Derbyshire, somebody had actually cut a hole in the fence Not to us. gain access. It wasn't us. We don't carry wire cutters around with us on it with a part of our kit, but it was a hole there. So fortunately, we could get into the compound and put the camera on top of the, the triangulation pillar. And similarly with this one, Wheaton Reservoir, re, reservoir, reservoir. Near, near Blackpool. Again, you can see from the, the height elevation, 45 metres, so not very high. But again, the pillar was within a compound with security cameras, locked gates, because the, the reservoir is obviously very important. It's roofed over. So even though we went once, we were peering through the fence, Fortunately, there was a number on the gate for United Utilities that we could ring and arrange to go back. And they were very helpful. The guy unlocked the gate and let us in there. We spent about half an hour producing the image. I mean, this one relates, obviously, to the previous two um, in that it's sort of, you can see a compound actually behind this, which is around the, um, the foam masts. But I think this one, one sums up a lot of things to me is that it's about that multiple layering of history that these sites are being used um, as, as beacons, as lookouts, as for water towers like you see on this one, uh, for radio, for television, for phone, all, all those things over the centuries they have been used for and all these different technologies are st steadily becoming obsolete including um, the trig pillars. Now this one, um, the, the pillars used to be, um, are used, sorry, not used to be, are used um, as an end point for walkers. Um, I'm just going to reference here uh, some writing done about triangulation by Julia Hernandez Garcia. And, and in her piece, she wrote that the trigs are totemic, uh, the neglected markers and touchstones on the landscape which is really something that you see when you're out because people will go and touch them um, at the end of a walk. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in this photograph here, you can see small groups of figures. And as we were, were taking the photographs, they were actually walking up and touching, touching the actual trig pillar, which, you know, obviously meant that they'd reached their goal. They touched it and they could move on then. Um, this particular pillar, um, Oh, how do you put it? Is it Gar Gar Brian? Brian? Garneth Garneth Ugain. Garneth Ugain. I think it's Garneth yeah, Ugain. Yeah. Right. On this particular pillar, you see actually it is a ruin. Uh, it's a ruin on a landscape. It, it is a remnant of, of obsolete technology. Um, there are only a hundred of the pillars that are preserved for current GPS mapping. Um, and the rest of them really are down to landowners or uh, the Bunch public, local that, groups, or the, that, yeah, or the know, public that yeah. take ownership of them, yeah. um, and it, because they can actually be removed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this this photograph here, you can see Snowden in the distance, which does have a you know a triangulation pillar, or a, it has a circular uh, observation point as well. Um, but it's not a primary triangulation point. As I said, we referenced back to the beginning. We're only concerned with the primary triangulation pillars, uh, and Snowden isn't classed as a primary. Um, and just to, again to reference what Stephanie was saying about the fact that landowners can actually remove them. This one is Castle Ring in Staffordshire, 
and you can just see on this small image here where the trig pillar was. You can see it in the enlarged version. So that's where the trig, the trig pillar was on this square patch of ground. Um, and we actually set the tripod up um, on that square and raised it, the height up to about three feet, the same height as a, as a, a trig pillar would be to, to actually complete the, the panorama. Um, so again, it's, the, you know, it's a different one because it's the absence of, of the trig pillar. And it can be a bit frustrating because on the map, on the OS map, sometimes they're still there. You still see that blue triangle, which indicates the trig pillar. But when you get there, it's gone. And, you know, it can, we try and do as much research as we can um, before we go. But even so, it can be a bit frustrating. So sometimes we're, we're hunting for them and we can't see them because they're camouflaged in the landscape. And sometimes or occasionally we're hunting for them and we can't find them because they literally have gone. So um, this is why it's, it, it has been such a, um, a long term project as well, mm. really, because there's an awful lot of time taken up um, going backwards and forwards to all these different places. Yeah. So just the kind of more or less the last the last slide yeah. before we move on to uh, showing you some of the 360 VRs. Um, just to kind of a way of indicating really the different ways in which we've tried to, to show the work. Um, you know, we are into the, the print aesthetic really, aren't we? Yes. We think they yeah. do, they should exist as large prints. And That's the best way to see them. And, and I feel that they're so important as large prints because you can walk up to them, you can see the detail, you can stand back and you can see the whole thing. And you can do that linear, you can walk alongside them uh, and see the whole landscape. Um, they, they definitely need to be seen as a print uh, and that's why obviously today we're going to show you some um, VR pans to just to show you what the, the detail in them because obviously we can't see prints at the moment because no one can get out to a gallery. No, uh, I mean, basically the, the, the top left there was Blackpool. Wasn't that was it? Blackpool and Fylde University we had, Centre. You can just see I think in, in the distance there we had smaller versions that were framed. They were the smaller songs that we've done but didn't really work well. They need to be as big as possible. So we printed up a large one that was over four meters long, including the photograph of the trig pillar at the end. And then this one is part of the Northern Eye, Northern Eye Festival um, in 2017, Colwyn, two, the, the inaugural one in 2017 in Colwyn Bay. And then finally at the bottom, that's the most recent um, iteration. That was at the Victoria Gallery Museum um, in Liverpool University. Uh, as part of the Look Festival last year. And I think really we've decided that it's this final way of presenting them that we actually feel is the best. Yeah. And they're presented, yeah. um, printed uh, in three meter long strips and then mounted onto uh, aluminium dye bond. Because mm. I mean, even the, the, the one that um, there in, in Oriel, or Colin Bay it was, that Colin was Bay. Uh, Paul actually you know, managed to get empty shops to show the work, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, and the best way that we could show them was to, again, print them large. And because there was virtually no budget, uh, we just kind of pinned them to the wall inside this shop. And we showed there 12 of the, the Welsh, uh, you know, Welsh uh, points. trig points, trig pillars that, that we'd done within that space. But, you know, there were a few problems with them kind of like bending a little bit. And, yeah. You know. So I think probably on aluminium is the best thing to do. But we actually work to three meters aluminium because that's about the longest sheet that we can actually afford to purchase and to be able to maneuver. Transport, yeah. yeah. So we're going to go, there's a few references for you if anybody wants to look at more of the work. And we're just going to now show you some, we're going to share another screen, hopefully, with no hopefully, problems. Uh, we, we, we have practiced it at least once, but um, who knows, you know. And we're going to do that and we're going to show you some of these VRs so you can have another look at some of the, the larger pans. Okay. We might have to... Um... So we're going to share another screen, honestly. Oh, we are. We hope we're going to share another screen. We might have to switch computers. Okay. So. Share. So we might have to bring that one down to there. 
Mm. Can anybody see it? Can, so it can some... We did see it then, Steph. You just, it's just gone off it. It was we saw it just a second ago. Right. Okay. So just bear with us. It's on the bottom there. Can so you can... see it now, Craig? Yeah. Yeah, right. that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Sorry, we're working on two screens here, and um, when we practiced it yesterday, it was great. It was so smooth, wasn't it? Streamlined. Craig, now... you know that's a lie. <laughs> okay, carry on. So, can you see that that, that yes, on the screen? Can. Okay, okay. So basically, there's two or three um, up on on screen here, uh, and we've done them as, as sort of 360 VRs and loaded them into a, a web browser. So we can. This is Dunstable Down, which, if you recall, was the the white triangulation pillar that was right next to the National, the Trust, National Trust, Car Trust Car Park. Um, and I'm just spinning around very, very, very slowly to avoid making people too dizzy. Um, and what's good about this is the fact that you can also zoom in to you know a particular detail. So this is online. I think it, you know it's quite a, quite a nice way, quite a nice interactive way for people to actually you know see them but i don't prefer this way i i think it's really important that they're shown as flat long ribbons like yeah but this is this is we're just having to compromise really and um, this is crystal. crystal and again you can you, well i say you can you, 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 if there's no cloud there you could see the isle of man you can actually see the rain though coming down because one of the things that we did for the exhibition in the, the last look festival was choose triangulation points that interrelated so we did Criffel that went to the Isle of Man. Yeah. Um, and then we went on the Isle of Man and did two on the Isle of Man. Went to Snaefell. Went to Snaefell, which I'll show you next. And Snaefell links back to Black Coombe. And yeah. this links uh, to Colton Fell. So you can see, see mountains appearing through the, the clouds there. It's like the little towns on the coast. West coast of Scotland and then moving around to the east. You oh, see move up and down. Wind turbines. Yeah, out to sea. Uh, Snaefell, it was very quickly. So this is Snaefell on the Isle of Man, which relates to the previous one in Criffel. Mm -hmm. uh, we can go right round. I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to set it to um, auto-rotate because it really does, it, it makes me feel a bit sick. But this manual way of, of moving round, so you can see that they are full 360 panoramas as, you, as you're going round back to the kind of starting point as it were and then you can zoom in and um i don't know if i don't know if kian's kian's watching but yeah that's, if kian uh, quail is if that, that's laxy that's, laxy laxly, I believe, that's, I think that's where he lives that's where he is if you're there kian so we've got time to have a quick two quick quick look at two more fell of carlton which again is scotland which relates to the previous one and you can see criffle which is on those sort of hills in the distance. And should we show the last one? We've got time to show the last yes, one, the very yeah. last one. And this one is Cave World. And this is on Humberside. So again, um, it's, it's quite, it, it was a short walk up, but it was sort of raised ab above sort of the Humber. Well, if we go around, I think we can just see the top of the, the Humber Bridge somewhere in the... Uh, in the distance there. Just there. there. Just there. Yeah. So, that's the, just the tip of, of the, the part of the Humber Bridge there. In the far, far distance. Um, so, again, this is, a, you know, a third way to view them. And, and, and even though we are very much, you know, into the kind of print aesthetic, I think you know this is probably a good way at this present moment in time to actually, you know, to to, to see these. I mean, you know, we are conscious of the kind of method of doing it and, and all the rest of it. We don't want to get involved in Google Street View and all that type well, of. Well, I you think know, that's the problem. You, you should have, around, you start but, to take it into that realm, really. And I think this is the, the, one of the problems. Just to finish off, one of the not problems, but one of the things we're conscious of is this link between you know the, the art of the art, basically the kind of artistic kind of qualities of the photographs and, and the kind of the science behind it and that's that link that delicate balance um you know is very important to us so um yeah that's it thanks for listening thank you very much guys um adam thank you everybody yeah, adam is gonna just say a few words thanks okay. everybody for listening thank you
Well, first of all, just to say thank you very much to Steve and Steph for that fascinating talk. Um, and thank you to all of you here on Zoom and for Facebook for listening in. I'm just going to post up a couple of links in the chat if you just want to have a little look at those. Um, first of all, we've recently launched a survey. We're very keen to see how we can develop 6x6 in the future, both in terms of our online content such as this, but also about how we might develop our physical exhibitions when hopefully one day we'll return to Ropes and Twines once the lockdown is over. Um, for us, 6x6 is as much about you, the community of photographers, both in Liverpool and further afield, as it is about the things that we do. So we would really like to get your feedback to see what kind of things we might be able to deliver that you would be interested in. Um, and as such, if you could click through on that first survey link and spend, it takes about three minutes, there's about eight questions, that would be really, really useful for us so that we can really push 6x6 forward and continue to produce hopefully interesting content that you want to continue continue to engage with. Um, and then secondly, um, if you could sign up to our mailing, mailing list, that would be really, really useful for us. It helps us streamline how we get information to you, particularly things about how we can share the links for Zoom and the passwords and things like that, but also lots of other information that we would like to share with you about kind of upcoming events and exhibitions. And then finally, just to wrap up about upcoming events, um, our next event here on Zoom and on Facebook will be uh, our very own Craig Easton in conversation with Daniel Meadows, looking at his desert island pics, five images that have inspired him, his work and his career. That will be taking place in two weeks on the 4th of June um, at 7pm. So hopefully we'll see you all there. Like I say, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Thank you, Cheers. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, for everybody. Listening. Thank you for that. And keep safe, and hopefully, we'll be out there soon. <laughs> Cheers. Great stuff. See you later.